everybody settle down now. Turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. Bring a message that I've preached over the years uh, along these lines, different places. The book of 1 Thessalonians talks about the great event that we're all looking forward to, the coming of the Lord. And uh, that, if you're a Christian this morning, you should be looking forward to Jesus coming back. Everybody knows the Lord's coming back. Everybody that believes the Bible knows that it's getting soon. It's getting close. Things are happening now. We're seeing things take place. We know the rapture's coming. We know the tribulation is coming. We know the Lord's coming back after the tribulation to set His foot down and, and um, establish His millennial kingdom. And, um, you know, the, uh, the Bible talks about on that day, He'll stand on the, the Mount of Olives there and that the mountain is going to split and half of it's going to go one way and half the other way before He sets up His kingdom. I read an interesting article. They said that Holiday Inn, Holiday Inn had purchased some an agreement and made an agreement they were going to build a big hotel there on the Mount of Olives. And they said that uh, it wouldn't work because some geologists, they'd done some structural study and found out that the Mount of Olives had a, a fault right in the middle of it. And they said that mountain's going to split one of these days. And I just said, uh, glory to God, hallelujah. I could have told them that. That ain't no place to build no holiday inn unless you want it split right, right down the middle. I tell you, the the Bible is true. You'll never get ahead of God's Word. If the Bible says something's going to happen, you can bank on it. It's going to take place. Isn't it wonderful in this crazy world that we have an anchor, a guidepost, something we can still believe in? Isn't that wonderful? Wonderful. We have a hope. Out there in the world this morning, there is no hope. There is no hope. The world's philosophy is eat, drink, and be merry and hope you don't get AIDS. And live it up as long as you can or something's going to kill you anyway. What a miserable way to live. I'm glad that we have hope in this world and also in the world to come. By His grace, by His marvelous grace, we have hope for the next world. Now what I want to do this morning is give you a brief outline of the book of First Thessalonians. Most of the time, when we think about the coming of the Lord, we think about people who are going to be left behind. Most of the time, when preachers preach about the coming of the Lord, we're thinking about all the people that's going to be left. What should mine and your view be toward the coming of the Lord this morning? I want to preach to you this morning on the subject, Christians and the second coming. Christians and the second coming. The book of 1 Thessalonians deals with the rapture. The book of 2 Thessalonians deals with what's going to be going on during the tribulation. And you can remember that when you study it doctrinally. Now, there are five chapters in the book of 1 Thessalonians. Each chapter ends with a note on the second coming of the Lord and how Christians should be ready for it. Let's look at it briefly while you got your Bibles open. Look at chapter 1 and verse number 10. Each one of these five chapters ends like this. It's amazing. Chapter 1 and verse 10. The Bible said, "...and to wait for His Son from heaven, whom He raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come." That's a great verse. We're not going to experience the wrath of God. And the Bible said in that verse, we are supposed to wait for Jesus to come. Look at chapter 2, verse 19. This chapter also ends with a word on the second coming of Christ. Second, uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 19. For what is our hope, Paul says, or joy, or crown of rejoicing, are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at His coming? For ye are our glory and joy. So we see in chapter 2 that we're to be rejoicing at the Lord's coming. Now look at chapter 3. Chapter 3 and verse 13. Chapter 3 and verse 13 also ends with a note on the coming of the Lord. To the end He may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all His saints. So we see in chapter 3 and verse 13 that we are to be unblameable at His coming. Now look at chapter 4. This is a great one. In chapter number 4, verse number 16, 17, and 18, we are seeing that in chapter 4 that we are to be caught up at His coming. Verse 17 said, Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up. There's where we get the word rapture. 
The word rapture means snatched. The word rapture means to be transported swiftly from one place to another. The word rapture means now you see me, now you don't. It means I, I'm standing here one minute and I'll say, I told you he's going to... Gone, buddy. Just like that. That's what it means. Now look at chapter 5. Chapter 5, look how it ends. It gives you all these instructions to be ready for the coming of the Lord. In verse 16, it said, Rejoice evermore. In verse 17, it said, Pray without ceasing. In verse 14, it said, Warn them that are unruly. Comfort the feeble-minded. Supporting the weak. Be patient toward all men. Pray without ceasing. Verse 17. And everything give thanks. Verse 18. Quench not the Spirit. In verse 19. Despise not prophesying. In verse 20. Prove all things. 21. Hold fast that which is good. 22. Abstain from all present uh, appearance of evil. And verse 23 said, And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless under the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So in chapter number 5, we are see that we are sanctified unto His coming. If you'll study the book of 1 Thessalonians, you'll see that it's a book trying to get Christians ready for the coming of the Lord. One of these hours the Lord's coming. One of these days He's coming. He could come today. What if this was that grand and glorious long-awaited day that the trumpet sounds and the dead in Christ rise? How would you stand before the Lord this morning? Let's look at these things. They say that one out of every 25 verses in the New Testament warn us of the coming of the Lord. We, they say that the skeptics have come and gone, but we still know that the Lord is coming. In chapter number 1, we are waiting for His coming. You say, preacher, what does that mean, waiting for His coming? Well, let's illustrate it like this. Let's say that there's two uh, ladies. One lives across the street from the other. Both of them, husband, is in the army, maybe uh, maybe in the war or something somewhere. Now, one of them, one of these ladies, she, uh, she prays for her husband every night. One of these ladies, she puts pictures of her husband all around in her house. When she walks through the, through the living room or the dining room, she sees a picture of her husband. Every time she thinks about him, her heart just hurt, wanting him to come home from the army. Uh, let's say every two or three days, she runs down to the mailbox to see if there's a letter from him. When she does get his letter, she runs, she opens it on her way back up to the house. Uh, she just can't wait. She's counting the days for his coming. She cannot wait. The other lady across the street, let's say she's uh, kind of grown used to her husband being gone. Let's say that she's kind of cooled off in her love toward her husband. Let's say she might even have a boyfriend. Let's say she's out fooling around with this boyfriend three or four nights a week. And uh, well, here's what she does. When she comes through the house, she turns the pictures of her husband around because it makes her feel guilty to see his face. She, she, uh, when she sees a letter from him, sometimes she don't even open it, throws it in a trash can. She's not waiting on her husband to come. Matter of fact, she wouldn't care if he ever come or not. She's not anxiously awaiting his coming. The other lady is waiting on her husband to come. Now, there are Christians in the world this morning. They're trying to live right. They're serving God. They're reading their Bibles. They're praying. They're witnessing. They're trying to stay clean. They're saying, Lord, come quickly. I'm ready for you to come. There are other Christians that are fooling around. They're uh, got tangled up in the affairs of this world. Which group are you in this morning? Are you really waiting on the Lord to come? Would it excite you if He come today? Are you too tangled up with the things of this world? Are you running around on Him? Are you having an affair against the Lord? Has the things of this world got your heart? Are you waiting on the Lord to come? I'm going to tell you this morning, friends, we need to wait. We need to wait on His coming. He's putting up with this world and His long suffering. You know most people today are not waiting on the Lord to come. If you went out and talked to people last night and said, do you expect Jesus to come today? They wouldn't, they'd wouldn't. say, why? But no, He ain't coming. Oh, no, there ain't no telling. He may never come. But the children of God are supposed to wait. We're supposed to stay right with God. We're supposed to wait on the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. But let me show you number two. In chapter number two, we are to be rejoicing at His coming. We are to rejoice at His coming. Now, I want to point out something to you this morning. I'm going to quote the words of an old song. Keep on the firing line. And one of those verses says, When, the, see, when we see the souls that we have helped to win, 
leading them to Jesus from the paths of sin. With a shout of welcome, we will all march in. So keep on the firing line. Paul said in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and those last few verses, he said, you know what I'm going to rejoice over when I get to heaven? I'm going to rejoice over you, my converts. We rejoice now because our names are written in the book of life. When we get to heaven, we're going to look around. We're going to see Jesus. We're going to see the mansions. We're going to shout for a million years. And we're going to rejoice over the souls that we have helped to win. You know, I've, I've seen people in some churches, they give Sunday school pens. There's nothing wrong with that. I think it's a good, good idea. If you come every Sunday for a whole year, you get a pen. If you come every Sunday the next year, you get a pen. That's good. That's fine. That's wonderful. But did you know, when you get to heaven, it's not going to really matter how many of those Sunday school pens that you have earned. It's, one, it's a good thing. I believe you'll be blessed and rewarded for going to Sunday school. Do you know what's going to matter when you get to heaven? When you look around and see your neighbor or that young person, or somebody you invited to church, and they got saved, and their life, and they wound up in heaven. That's what's going to matter when you get to heaven. Boy, you know what I got to think about them tracks. And uh, these boys give out tracks all the time. Somebody give me a track. Anybody got one on you? Amen. Here's a boy right here with a track. They give out these things all the time. I told you not to give out them with my picture on it. Ain't nobody going to come to church if they see that. Uh, they, 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 had, uh, they have these tracks. Let's just say Donnie here, he takes his track. Let's say he goes in somewhere and eats him a hamburger. And let's say when he gets through, he gives the wait. He said, hi, ma'am, give you something to read. Let's say he's in Charlotte. He never sees her again. Let's say she goes home. She reads that track. Who is good? Nobody. Who is sin? Everybody. Where did sin come from? Garden of Eden. God's price on sin. Hell fire. God's way out. Jesus Christ. Let's say the Lord starts dealing with her, right? And she gets down on her knees and gets saved. He never seen her before. Never seen her sin. And then one day when the Lord comes back, we're up there in heaven and we're rejoicing around the throne. All of a sudden somebody comes up and says, uh, uh, are you are you that big guy that gave me that track down there that day? He said, yes I am. She said, I just want you to know that I've got saved. I'm not in hell. I'm in heaven. I'm glorifying God. Thank you, brother. And he'll say, well, hallelujah. Woo! Put another diamond in your crown and rejoice over the soul that you have to win. This world don't think soul winning's much, does it? This world don't think, ah, we mean going out here and talking to somebody and getting down on your knees and praying. That ain't no big deal. But in the eyes of God, that's the greatest thing that we can do is lead somebody to the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, we have parents here this morning. Where's your bus parents at? Uh, Brother Don, right over there. Uh, would y'all stand up? I don't want to embarrass you. Stand up over there, man. The black. See these people right here? They just won them the Lord recently out on the bus ride. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. One of these days when we see the Lord and they're not in hell, but they're up there in heaven. You see, what really matters then? Ain't that right? Yeah, that's what really matters. By the way, I think a church ought to be after souls. I think we ought to be after souls. Thank God somebody had the lights on the night I came in and got saved. Thank God somebody prayed. Thank God somebody tried to win me to Jesus. And I did get saved. You say, you reckon that really happened, preacher? Somebody will just walk up to us and say, because of your testimony, I'm here? Sure, I believe it. Many tracks we put out, you know, tell me how many people got saved. We don't even know about it. Tell you something happened to me one time. I was down at the trade lot when the trade lot used to be down here years ago. And I started witnessing this boy. And I said, uh, are you saved? He's from England. Had an English accent. And his name was Buddy. And me and him sat down, I think like on the back of a truck. And I said, Buddy, let me show you how to get saved. And I took the Bible and showed him how to get saved. He was under conviction. And I said, you want to get saved? And he said, yes, sir, I sure do. And I said, let's pray. So I bowed with him. We prayed right there. I said, buddy, you asked Jesus to save your soul. He said, I'll do it. And you know what? He got saved. I found out where he lived down in Morgan. I went down and visited him not long after that, a time or two. And one time I met him in a little, I think it was in the Tasty Freeze. Down, it used to be the Tasty Freeze in Morganton. And one night, uh, me and him was sitting there eating. And I was sitting across the table and I said, now buddy, you need to tell your friends about God. You need to t- witness. You need to take tracks from them. Tell your friends about the Lord because you never know. Somebody will to walk up to you in heaven one of these days and tell you it's because of your testimony that they're saved. I said, you never know. And while I was telling him that, this honest truth, while I was telling him that, there was a guy walked up. And he punched me on the shoulder and he said, you're a preacher, ain't you? And I said, yes, sir. And he said, well, I th- I'm glad I ran into you. I want to tell you something. And I said, yeah, what is it? He said, one night you come down the road, coming down 70, 
He said, you was in a little old Volkswagen. And he said, I was hitchhiking. You picked me up. And I said, yep. And I just got through telling Buddy how somebody could walk up and tell you. And he said, you witnessed to me and talked to me about God. And old Buddy's eyes started getting about that big around. And I said, yeah, amen. And he said, you know what? He said, I went home. And he said, I took my mama. And he said, I think about what you said. And he said, I went to church that Sunday. And I got right with God. And I got in there. And boy, I tell you what, old Buddy. I mean, his mouth is open. I said, see there, Buddy. I said, it happened right there. Now, now, now really, if Buddy hadn't been with me, I would have shouted. I, but I didn't want him to think. That's the first time that ever happened to me, which it was. Hey, but I, but I, I didn't want him to know that. I mean, didn't mean when I said, "Glory to God!" Whoa, the Lord used my tip. But I thought, see there, buddy, happens every day. I, I see there. If you'll just tell people about the Lord, you got to do it. And I want to tell you what, brother. You, when we see the souls that we have helped to win, when we go up there and they say, "Listen, I would be burning and screaming in the flames of hell," but I'm not in the flames of hell because you come and knocked on my door and you took my bus kids to church on a bus and you preached to me you witnessed to me we'll shout at the coming of the Lord when we see the souls we have to win you know what I'd do if I was some of you people I'd get me something to shout about Use you, you ought to take at least one evening a week and try to win somebody to God man I mean some of you people you're around kids at school all week you young people that go to the public school you're a missionary there you could get your friends in here the youth rally youth services see them get saved brother get some rewards in heaven we're rejoicing at the Lord's coming now let me look at chapter 3 just a moment in chapter 3 we're to be unblameable at His coming Boy, there'll be so many people be ashamed in that day. If you girls was half as worried about how you're going to look on that day in the Lord's sight as you look before you come to church, you'd be dangerous, you know it, for God. Amen. I mean, there ain't nothing wrong with you looking nice. You ought to. Try your best. But we ought to worry more about how God sees us than how people see us. We were about, oh, I need this. And I need, is my dress all right? Can you see my slip? Is my, I got a, you know, all this stuff. Well, that's fine. All right, I'm proud of you. But listen, what does God see when He sees you? He sees your heart. He sees your mind. He knows your life. Brother, you want to be unblameable at His coming? Live right. Live right. You want to be ready to meet the Lord when He comes back? Live for God. Live for God. They said one time that this principal came in the classroom. And he said, now, boys and girls, he said, I'm going to come back one day this week, and I'm not going to tell you when. And he said, the kid what got the cleanest desk is going to get a reward. And he said, I'm not telling you when, but I'm going to come back and you're going to get a prize. The kid that's got the cleanest desk. There's this one little girl, she had the messiest desk in the whole school. And when he left, she said, I'm going to win the prize. They said, you? She said, yes, sir, me. She, they said, well, how are you going to do it? She said, every morning when I first come in, I'm going to straighten up my desk, put all my papers in a trash can, put my, uh, straighten up my books, put my pencil and eraser up here, hang my pocketbook on the back of my desk, and I'll be ready when he comes. And they said, yeah, but what if he don't come in the morning? She said, well, I know what I'll do. Every day, right before lunch, I'll straighten up my papers again, put my pencil and eraser up here, hang my pocketbook on the back of my uh, 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 desk, and I'll be ready when if he comes at lunchtime. And they said, but yeah, but what if he comes late in the evening? She said, well, I know what I'll do. Every evening right before we go, I'll straighten up all my paper, throw them in the trash can, put my books up, put my pencil and eraser up here, hang my pocketbook on the back of my desk, and I'll be ready if he comes in the evening. And they said, but yeah, but what if he comes in between lunch and the evening? She thought for a minute. She said, well, I'll just keep it clean. You let that sink in every man. You know how to be ready to keep to meet the Lord? Keep it clean, brother. Keep it clean. Stay right with God every day. There's a lot of people be in good shape if the Lord come on Sunday evening. Yes, sir. Just got out of church, Lord. Amen. Ready to follow it? But, oh, boy, if He comes Friday night. Where would the Lord have caught you if He'd have come Friday night at 9 o'clock? Would He have to drag you out of a movie theater? Amen, brother. Preach it. You say a, per- a church just begging the preacher preach about going to movies? Sure, man. What kind of dumb preacher don't preach about going to movies? He ain't worth a dime. Don't look down. It ain't time to pray. I'll tell you when it's time to pray. Look up. Why would he find you? Don't get mad at me. It ain't my fault. 
You know it's crazy to get mad at the preacher for do, for saying something about something and ain't it ain't my fault. If I say something about drinking and you drink, don't get mad at me, man. That's like a woman getting mad and smashing her mirror because it shows her the wrinkles in her face. Amen. It ain't my fault. I'm telling you, why would Jesus? You say, well, I don't see nothing. Well, do it. I mean, you say, well, I wouldn't mind if he caught me. Well, help yourself. Where would he have found you if he'd have come last night? Where would you have been? What would you have been doing? Are you waiting on him? Are you going to be unblameable at his coming? Are you going to be unblameable at his coming? He said one time, this fella come to the drive-in theater and he got on there on the microphone. All his cars sitting out there and he said, he got on a, on a PA system. He said, all right, you dirty rat. He said, I know you're out there with my wife. And he said, I got my shotgun right here and I'm going to come out there and I'm going to blow your blankety blank head off right now. And 43 cars drove out of the parking lot. <laughs> but that's the way it is. Amen. People ain't ready for Jesus to come. And it ain't a joke, brother. When He comes, you better be ready to meet Him. You think it's... You know these people won't come to our church because I scream and holler at them? They'll say, well, I, I just don't like somebody hollering at me. I'm, I'm nice and sweet to hear what He's going to be when He comes back. Buddy, I'm telling you, He'll blister hide. I mean, it's going to be bad. I'm telling you, you're going to be unblameable at He's coming. Be ready. Let me tell you what a great man said one time. John Wesley was one of the greatest Christians that's ever lived in this world. He said this. They said, I see one Sunday, they said, John Wesley, what would you do if you knew this is your last day on earth? You know what he said? This puts me under conviction every time I hear it. He said, I would go and preach the Sunday morning service. He said, on Sunday afternoon, I would visit the sick and the poor, come back and preach that night, and return home that evening and throw myself on my bed and plead the mercy and protective grace of God. In other words, I'd do just what I always do. I wouldn't change a thing. I want to tell you something, people. I could just stop this message right here. I'm not, but I could. When If somebody asked you, what would you do if it was your last day, and you said, I wouldn't change a thing, you living right. Ain't that right? You living right, buddy, if you live every day like it's your last. But we don't do it. We think, I've got plenty of time. I want to do this. I want to do that. I want to go here. I want to go there. And we're not going to be ready when the Lord comes. You know how to be ready when the Lord comes? Keep it clean. Chapter 4. We notice in chapter 4, we are to be caught up at His coming. Thank God. That's what made the old preacher said, I am not looking for death. I am looking for Him. We're not looking for the undertaker. We're looking for the upper taker. We're not looking for a hole in the ground. We're looking for a hole in the sky. I tell you what, I remember, I remember some, one time somebody asked me, they said, uh, they said, Danny, uh, what does that scripture mean in John chapter 20 and verse 7? You don't have to turn to it now, but it said this, when the Lord died, they said, uh, uh, that they, they, they wrapped him in those clothes, you know, and it said when they took his body, they said when they entered into the tomb on resurrection day, his body was gone. And they said that his linen grave clothes were laying over here. And right in the middle of one of the most important story in the Bible, on the resurrection, it said the napkin that was about his head was wrapped together in a place by itself. Isn't that odd? That the Holy Spirit would take time to tell you that the body clothes over here and the head clothes over here? What's the deal? And they, somebody said, uh, they said, Danny, what does that mean? Why does it just stop right there almost on purpose and say the napkin that was about his head was over here by itself. I got thinking about that and I thought, Lord in mercy, I never heard nobody say that, but I, I said, I reckon because at the resurrection his body come up and then he went back to heaven and that's represent, he's the head of the church, we're the body. And the body and the head are temporarily separated. Our head is in heaven this morning. He's the head of the church. We are the body. So the head is wrapped together in a place by itself. And the body is still here. I got news for you. The body is going to join the head. That's one way you know the church ain't never going down. Because a man ain't never drowned with his head out of water. Don't care how deep it gets, you ain't drowning if it don't get up past your head. And no matter how wicked this world gets, our head's out of water this morning. And we ain't going to drown. We're leaving, brother, in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye. Let's imagine if it was this morning. What if the rapture was this morning? What if it was like two minutes from now? Would you be ready? What if the Lord has come back in two minutes? All right, now. What's going to happen? 
Bible said in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. Just like that. People say, well, I'm going to wait till I see the clouds roll back and I'm going to get out and pray. No, it's a twinkling of an eye, just like that. Speed of light. You know how fast light travels? 186,000 miles a second. Say it again. 186,000 miles a second, man. That's how fast we're going to go be the Lord. Illustrate. They say that if you drive a car, the average person blinks their eyes 25 times a minute. Blink, not twink. Twink quicker than blink. It is. A blink, it takes you like one twenty-fifth of a second or something like that to blink your eyes. The average person, 25 times a minute, blinks their eyes. Some people, you know, been messed up on drugs or something. They, they, they blink a lot more than that. They blink about 300 times a minute. But the average person, something like 25 times a minute, blinks their eyes. It takes one fiftieth of a second or something like that. That means that if you drive a car 55 miles an hour on a 10 hour trip blinking your eyes 25 times a minute, you would drive 33 miles with your eyes shut. On a 10 hour trip. Now, ain't no wonder everybody's getting killed out there. People driving 33 miles with their eyes shut, man. I've, I've almost went 33 straight miles with mine shut. I'd open them, look, am I still on the road? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's awful. I'd be so sleepy, I'd be about to die. But you know something? That's slow. That's slow. When the Lord comes, it's going to be just like, boom, gone, brother, gone. You see, the Bible said in Job chapter 26 that He stretched out the north over the empty place. You know that hole they talk about, the black hole, and the, the, the hole in the north, and the scientists thought they discovered it. The Bible said that years and years and years ago, that he stretched out the north over the empty place. There's a straight shot, dead north, headed toward the city of God. That's where, the, that's where heaven is, dead north. Heaven's not east, heaven's not west, heaven ain't south. It's direct north of this world. The city of Zion, the Bible said, on the sides of the north, the city of the great king. The Bible said promotion don't come from the east or the west or the south, but God is the judge. That's what the Bible said. And God is, lives in the north. So God says, I'm going to stretch out this hole over this empty place. Now, if there's a sea of glass up there, it's frozen according to the Word of God, and it's sea of glass. So what the Lord does, He goes fishing one day, and He becomes a fisher of men. So when a man fishes through ice, he's got to cut a hole in the ice. He comes down here, he, he preaches the gospel, he dies on the cross, and he's the bait on the hook. We're fish down here swimming underneath this great deep. We bite the hook, we're on the line, right? When you get saved, you're on the hook. One of these days, see the, the man's up there fishing through the ice, through the hole in the north. He's got his bait down here on earth. We bit it. All these other fish just swimming on down the river. One of these days, the Lord's going to start reeling them in. That's the rapture. We're going right out through the north, right out through that hole. Nothing can stop it. Nothing can hinder it. This old world can't hold you down. You're going to lose the gravitational pull of the earth. And Satan tried to block it in Ezekiel chapter 8. But God God put a door in John chapter 10, pulls us through Matthew 4, 19, and He said, I'll make you fishers of men that we can take people with us when we leave through the North Hole. Caught up. Caught up. Let's look at the last one. Chapter 5. We're to be sanctified unto His coming. Let me just read these things off to you and I'm going to be through. You want to be ready for the Lord to come back? I feel sorry for some of you. Some of you, your mind's so tangled up with the world that you can't even think spiritual. And I know what you need to do. You just won't do it. What you need to do is take time and spend with God and spend time in your Bible and praying on a daily until you get your thoughts right. That's what you need to do. One little trip to the altar here for a couple of minutes ain't going to do what you need done. You need a daily walk with God and spending time with the Lord. You can't lay your Bible up from one week to the next not even pick it up and then come walk in church and feel like, well, I'm ready to meet the Lord. It don't work like that. It's got to be a daily walk. You know what you need to do? According to verse 11, you need to edify one another. How long has it been since you went to a brother and just put your arm around him and said, hey man, I appreciate you. Anything I can ever do to help you. 
just let me know. I love you. You know what that is? You're edifying. Out yonder, we had the best time working yesterday. The men just cutting up. Hey, brother, God bless you. Hallelujah. We joke and go on and, and just move me and that's free labor. And brother, they worked. A service and God bless you. You know what that is? That edifies you. Edifies you. We're not in the in the business of just tearing each other down. We're in the business of edifying. Do something nice. Hey, do this before you leave here today. Speak a nice word to somebody. Get in the habit of edifying another brother in Christ. Then the Bible said support the elders. It said warn and comfort the feeble-minded. If somebody needs comforting, pat them on the back. Say, I love you. I'm praying for you. Don't, don't avoid them. Don't turn your head. Don't walk by the other, on the other side of the road. Say, hey, I love you. I'm praying for you. Comfort them. And the Bible said rejoice evermore. We need to rejoice. We need to rejoice. We need to rejoice. Brother, listen, it wouldn't bother me a bit if we come back in here tonight and just had an old-fashioned rejoicing shouting service. We're just saying, glory to God, glory to God, glory to God, glory to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Amen. You say, that's old-fashioned. I know it, but I don't want to be in the trend with this world. This world's crazy. Thank God we still believe in saying hallelujah and glory to God and amen. That's what we're going to say in heaven one of these days. Then the Bible said, pray without ceasing. Do you pray without ceasing? Do you go around with a prayer on your lips? Do you drive it down the road? Lord, help me today. Help me to stay right. Lord, bless me today. Help me to resist the temptation that's coming. Help me to do right. Pray without ceasing. It don't mean that you stay on your knees 24 hours a day. It means you stay in an attitude of prayer with a prayer on your lips at work or school. Pray while you're going to school. Pray while you're doing your homework. Pray while you're at work. Just say, God, help me. God, help me to be a witness. Just pray in your heart and in your mind. The Bible said, quench not the Spirit. That means that the Holy Spirit of God's dealing with you today and He's put His finger on something in your life and you refuse Him and say no, you just quench the Spirit. That means if God done something to you this morning, if He touched you this morning, that you need to be on this altar getting it right. You're quenching the Spirit if the Lord deals with you about something and you push Him away. That's what it means. The Bible said, despise not prophesying. And that's, of course, the Word of God, preaching, prophecy, all that stuff. Don't despise it. It may rub you wrong, but agree with it. The Bible said, prove all things. Get you a King James Bible. Use it for your infallible ruler. And if somebody comes knocking on your door with some junk, get out your Bible and prove to them where they're wrong and prove to them where you're right. The Bible said, abstain from all appearance of evil. Don't let yourself be caught in a compromising situation. Stay clean. Stay right. Keep your desk straightened up because He's coming just at any day, preserved and sanctified unto His coming. One of these days when the Lord comes, we'll say, if I'd have known it was going to get here this quick, I'd have done a lot of things different. But it'll be too late to do it different then. Let's start today and make it different now. Let's stand with our heads bowed. Our heads are bowed. Eyes are closed this morning. What kind of shape would you be in spiritually this morning if Jesus came back today? Huh? Maybe there's somebody here this morning, say, Preacher, there's some changes I need to make. There's some commitments I need to take care of. There's some things I need to quit doing. By the grace of God, I'm going to just start off anew and afresh today. I want to be ready when Jesus comes. I want to get me some souls. I want to just come to the altar this morning and ask God to make me a soul winner so I can take some people to heaven with me. What about it, young people? Mamas and daddies? Maybe you're here and you're saved, but it's been a long time since you've really been in the will of God. God's put His finger on something in your life this morning. Quench not the Spirit, buddy. Quench not the Spirit. Father, I pray You'd do something in our hearts this morning. Do something real. Do something that'll last. God, help us to be ready for You coming. Help us to make the changes we need to make this morning so that we can rejoice one day when You come. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.